Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome once again to Amateur Astronomers Incorporated for our weekly presentations that we give every Friday night at 8.30. Um, our speaker tonight is AAI member Al Witzkel. He's a longtime member of AAI. He's a past president. He's the current chairman of what we call the IQC, the, um, which ha is how you can learn how to operate the telescopes here. Al has a very, uh, very interesting career um, in optics. Uh, one of the things he's done was to work on the Galaxy satellite, uh, working on the optics for that. Um, so we really have a very good member uh, with a lot of experience. And um, so I'd like to introduce you to Al, who will be talking about the great national total, total solar eclipse that's coming on April 8th of this year. Okay, so Al. Thank you, Mary. And good evening. Okay, um, we are coming up on a heck of an event, uh, which deals, uh, of course, with the total eclipse of the sun. How many people have seen one or more? A couple? Okay, so I got a couple experienced people. Okay, you guys can get some sleep. The rest of them can stay awake. <laughs> Seriously, though, uh, it is a spectacle beyond words, to be honest with you. I've seen a total of six of them. This is going to be number seven if everything works out right. Sometimes you get a good cliffhanger in there, too, when the clouds come in at the wrong time. So let's uh, move along in here. Okay, so the most exciting celestial event, I dare say, of uh, 2024 is this upcoming total solar eclipse of April 8th. Uh, it's an overview here presented today of the event. It had to document the rare phenomena. Document equals, of course, photography. Okay. An awesome spectacle. This is the total solar eclipse of July 10th, 1991. Uh, this is slightly clearer than how we saw it because, again, I mentioned though about cliffhangers. Uh, AI split into two sections. One went to Hawaii and one went to uh, Mexico. Uh, it turned out that Hawaii, we had the cliffhanger. Uh, it was that close to being clouded and rained out. However, we did get to see it. It's one of those things it's called eclipse weather and eclipse luck. And this is uh, from, uh, I believe, from Mexico City. Okay. Because of an astonishing coincidence, the sun's diameter, of course, a little geometry here is 865,400 miles. Uh, the moon's diameter is 2,160 miles. Sun's distance at 93 million. And the moon's distance, of course, on average is about 239,000. Or, saying it quickly, the sun is 400 times larger than the moon, but the moon is 400 times closer. Therefore, we can have total eclipses. But nowhere else, by the way, in the solar system is this geometry repeated. Yes, you can look at Jupiter and you see its uh, four main uh, Galilean satellites moving back and forth, and they cast shadows. But those of you stood at that on a platform... Uh, under that shadow, you would see an annular eclipse, a ring eclipse, which we'll talk about in a few moments. So a little bit of phys solar physics. Uh, those of you who took the QO course or, of course, have studied the sun yourself, you're pretty much aware of this. Our star, of course, is a big nuclear fusion reactor. In the core, hydrogen is converted into helium. At a, and uh, with release of some energy, it only converts about 4 million tons of matter directly to energy every second. It'll be doing that for quite a long time, so you can get some sleep tonight. Uh, most of the time, we view the sun. Usually, we're viewing it uh, at the photosphere up here, which is the bright surface of it. Just above that, and this is actually a little bit thick compared to that, it really is. You have a chromosphere, a color sphere. Uh, this is where we see filaments, a lot of uh, activity in the light of hydrogen. Uh, the granules that you're seeing here, think of a convection in a pot of boiling water. It's basically the same thing, except these are all the gases coming from within the sun, heated by the core, and coming to the surface, falling back down when they cool down from 10,000 degrees to maybe about 8,500. Sunspots and magnetic effects picked up by that nuclear reactor, basically. And sometimes magnetic fields, of course, spill over into space, carrying charged particles, and not just uh, the contaminants, which are, by the way, they come right out of the uh, chromosphere. But a lot of particles, charged particles, come from there and interact with the upper atmosphere of our planet. 
and give us northern lights displays. Uh, the core is surrounded by an area called the radiative zone, which is where the energy is going straight out. It hits a convective zone after that, which is where all this activity that we see in hydrogen alpha light and red light uh, occur. And on the outside, this is interesting, the core is about 50 million degrees uh, Fahrenheit. The surface is on the order of about 10,000, but the outer atmosphere or the corona is up in the million, a million to a million and a half degrees, all because of just energy content. Remember, temperature is defined as the motion of atoms when it's impinged on by energy. In this case, it's got lots of energy. Okay, so this is how basically it works. Uh, the moon's orbit's tilted five degrees to that of the Earth's path around the sun, and it crosses in front of the sun only when the shadow lines up with the Earth. So it's, we have an average of about two solar eclipses a year. You can have as many as five, but two of those are probably would be total or annual, and the rest are partials. They don't quite work. We'll talk about that in a moment. The eclipse seasons happen only during new moon phase. Solar eclipses repeat themselves every 18 years, 10 and two-thirds days, and they are said to be members of a given saros or a family of eclipses. So the types of eclipses, this is what we're really interested in right now, this time, of course. There are total eclipses where the sun is completely covered surface as the shadow of the moon sweeps across the earth and the umbra reaches the bottom. When you have a penumbra over here, the outer shadow, this is where if you stood there, you'd see a partial eclipse. So you're looking for where that umbra goes. As you can see here, here it's graphically shown as a path that cuts across the earth. Okay, and two others are uh, annular and central. Uh, annulars are when basically you are standing outside the focus of you over this shadow, and it's called an antumbra, which I had only found out when, a couple years ago when I first found this slide. I've never seen it in print since, so I'm not sure what's happening here. But if you stand over here, basically you're just going to see a ring of fire. This is a dangerous eclipse to work with because there's no time. And so partials, of course, are very dangerous anyway, if you're looking at raw sun, pure sun. Uh, with a, an annular, you have a ring of fire, basically. You have a ring of uneclipsed sun, rather dangerous. And then, of course, next step, of course, of partials where you're out. Sometimes the umbra does not reach the earth at all, too. And the penumbra is going to be standing. This is what it looks like. So this is why you can see it's on, uh, this is filtered. This is on eclipse. This is just as dangerous as looking at the full sun. And here it is, the V eclipse. This is the last one that was visible in the continental United States. There have been several in the interim years. Uh, was back in 2017. And the next one will not take place until 2044. And actually, that eclipse is going to be coming down here and just make it to the Canadian border. So... We have a couple years to go on at 20 for that. There'll be others across the earth. I'm really kicking for uh, 2027. Uh, that's going to be cool because it's going to, you'll be able to go to Gibraltar and stand there with 5 million other amateur astronomers viewing the eclipse. But then it's going to curve across North Africa. It's kind of curved down and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be very, it will go over, but it's going to be very close to Luxor. And there is a gate there which is left over from the Egyptian dynasties, where it shows what's called the winged sun. There was a period of about six or 700 years around, centered around 14, 1450, I believe, uh, BC, where no less than 20 eclipses crisscrossed over the Nile. And at Luxor, they decided that they would show the winged sun, as it's called, with a sun disk and two snakes coming out of it, and then wings. Everyone's probably seen that in one or more museums or in terrible movies and such. But the cool thing would be I'd like to be able to stand there because Luxor is within that, is within the path of totality and be able to photograph the winged sun and the winged sun in the sky. Now, that'd be a cool photo. So, well, like I said, though, here, though, in North America, the next one is not going to be till 2044, and the good one is 2045, where it will cut across, cut, cut down across uh, uh, Florida and 
perfect place to be able to see it. Six minutes, six seconds. Mm -hmm. The longest that can ever occur on Earth was uh, seven minutes and, I believe it was seven minutes and 45 seconds. Slowly but surely, the moon is moving away from the Earth. So eventually, quite a long time from now, we will no longer have uh, total eclipses. So you got to see them now. Huh. Okay? Keep that in mind, folks. You got to get out there. So what to expect? You know, gallery of some... Uh, Images and such I've, I've taken and others have too. Totality comes to Hawaii. I mentioned it before, 1991. It's taken with a C5 at F11, 200 speed film, thousandth of a second, just to catch what's called the Bailey's Beads over here, where the light of the uneclipsed sun still makes it through some of the craters on the very edge of the sun. And this was a surprise. It's seahorse prominence. That's it from the chromosphere. And glows in the light of hydrogen alpha and hydrogen beta. Alpha, of course, is red, but it also, if you notice, there's a component in there uh, hydrogen beta, a little bit of uh, blue, blue purple. And of course, we have calcium, which also glows about the same, in the close to the same wavelength. Now, this is my photo over here. I got lucky, very lucky. In fact, we all did. Notice in this shot here, which was taken up on the hill, if you will, at Mauna Kea. Uh, the big, the I think it's the second largest volcano there, and an extinct, or at least seems to be. That's where all the big observatories are. But look at that shot. We had some haze. This was the upper haze that still remained. And to show you how dangerous this was, uh, as far as endangering seeing the eclipse, this is a little too close for comfort. We're in Kona, Hawaii, and uh, the cool thing about this was that. The clouds parted, as you can see over at the top shot there. Um, at the time, uh, I was reading a revival. Um, well, you know, a little secret, folks. Al happens to have learned how to read through comic books. Yes, Superman, not Batman so much. Um, discovered Marvel in the early 70s. But in the early 90s, they revived the Dell Gold Key comic called Solar Man of the Atom. So, when Valiant Publishing came out with that, they had the origin story. They revamped it for the 90s. But the point is, they quoted Ecclesiastes, I believe, and the sun also rises. There it was. Amazing. And uh, really, really great. A few seconds later, we had totality. That's the diamond ring effect as the sun's coming down this way. And this wonderful little prominence on the top there, which I closed in with the other instrument. Uh, this is speed of 200. I like that level, that uh, film or whatever now speed uh, above all else. Uh, F11.6 refractor, a Sears Discoverer refractor, which the only thing original about it, by the way, is the objective lens. Everything else, I replaced the focus of the two. The mount, I mean, the mount, I mean, you look at a cross side through five feet of lead and it falls over. But it was a good optical system. I was exposing it here at a thousandth of a second, and this is three seconds. There you see the corona. There was still a little effect, not just from the clouds, but the fact that you notice that kind of yellowish color. That was from uh, Mount Pinatubo. And there was still the gases that had flown up, up 60, 70,000 feet, and it was affecting our view. So there was a lot, of, a lot of imagery, a lot of cool stuff here. Okay. Then in... Uh, uh, 19, yeah, that's right, uh, 1998, Companions in the Sky, Mercury to the top, Jupiter to the bottom, this is from Aruba, 1998, and a four second exposure, because I wanted to get the plants, it turned out they came out okay, and then I saw a coronal streamer coming up, a 200 millimeter telephoto. Okay, and uh, Regulus, and the August 21st, 2017 total eclipse. Again, 200 speed. This time it was digital. Four second exposure, F11, that same refractor. But I mentioned Regulus because there it is. Now, those of you that have done photography yourself, you know, you've heard of a thing called uh, depth of field. Anybody recognize that? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. You try getting the depth of field to photograph that thing at 28 light years, and this one over here at 93 million miles in the same image. 
It's a joke, son. Uh, but that was, I looked at that. I gambled I would get the picture. And sure enough, about four or five of my shots at that uh, long exposure worked out pretty well. Now, I don't, Wayne Orgenstein is not here. He and Mike Luchik uh, went, I, be, I believe they went to uh, North Africa for this. Uh, this is the total solar eclipse of uh, March 29th. And you see a partial phase over here, a little further on, starting to go that big smile in the sky. And then pull, I don't know, I don't have any uh, exposure values. I'm guessing this is probably about a thousandth of a second. I have to talk to Wayne about that so I get this information correct. And you see some of the prominences, the uh, extensions of material from the chromosphere. And a little bit uh, after totality, it started. Then, of course, he went a little bit longer. And then they processed it. And this is what we were seeing, chrome streamers all through here. Magnetic fields are outlined. Really magnificent work. <laughs> if somebody hasn't muted themselves, please do so. It's very annoying. Okay. The last uh, U.S. total eclipse was in 2017. This is from Marion, Illinois, which I think uh, Bonnie and I may be going there again. Repeat performance. I imagine that within seven years, two, eclipse, two total eclipses of the sun crossing right over that area. Uh, this is uh, August 21st of 2017. Again, 200 speed, four second exposure. Now you can see some of the coronal uh, streamers coming out from it. So here's path, here are the paths in North America from 2001 to 2050. And as I mentioned before, if you look at Southern Illinois over here, there is the cross within seven years of each other. That's amazing. And the next one up is 2044, August 23rd, which just crosses up. As, that's Montana, if I remember correctly. So that's going to be interesting, too. That's also in August of that year, 23rd. Okay. Great North American total eclipse is coming, and it's coming very fast. I always had that feeling that I'm standing in the path of the shadow of the moon. It is coming your way. You know it's coming your way. In the case of the one coming uh, that will be in uh, April of this year, it'll be moving at over 1,700 miles per hour. Ready or not, it's going to come over. It's the inevitability of it, that you will be standing there. You know the shadow is coming in. Whether your equipment works or not, whether the weather doesn't want to cooperate or it does, it's all a gamble. But this is where if you do have a clear sky, you're going to hit the lottery. That's how fantastic that feels. And as you can see in the shot, you can see where some of the major cities, Buffalo is relatively close to here. We're going to probably be around here. What I wanted was down here, off Dallas, and particularly uh, uh, Waco or <laughs> Sulphur Springs. If you look at map of Sulphur Springs and you plot the path of the eclipse, the center line goes practically up Main Street. The problem is I'm worried about is safety because we have tons, unfortunately, tons of illegals that are coming over the border, unrestrained, unstopped, and I don't know what's going to happen in this country on that, but... I wanted to go down there, so I'll be sacrificing about 45 seconds of totality. Down in Texas, it will be uh, 4 minutes and 42, I believe, right off here. So I'm going to be sacrificing about 45 uh, seconds, precious seconds, to come up here. Be able to see it. That's you know, the way it goes, I, I fear. And so where to go, this is just an outline of the various cities. The most heavily populated, all the way from San Antonio and all the way through here. Absolutely beautiful. Montreal has the biggest population, which would be up here, but very close to the edge. What you want when you go into these eclipses is try to get as close as you possibly can to the center line. That gives you the more time. The further away you are from the center line of the eclipse, the less time. And it's also not quite centered, too, a little bit. That's, that's part of the whole thing. I mean, this, this is going to be an amazing place, but the problem is, like I said, I'm concerned with the lawlessness down that area. But I'm still going to talk about this because here's a close-up for Texas. You notice there are two pads over here. This occurred last year. Uh, this is an annular, the total one for you on here. There's Dallas. So you can get right out here 
and you'll be able to see uh, totality. The best of all, I'm afraid, uh, is in Mexico itself. Okay, further up the path. Well, okay, well, this cuts off. This is Illinois, and we'd be down here at three and five, continuing up, then going north along the path. So the closest I imagine to getting to this would probably be Buffalo or Niagara Falls. I do not recommend looking at the eclipse near the falls. There's lots of lots of artificial rain, otherwise known as a spray from the falls. But Buffalo is pretty close to the center line. And uh, Rochester is just a little bit off of it. And I believe, yeah, Cleveland's on the edge. So this is also, if you want to shorten your trip. But unfortunately, though, you also have to contend with clouds. And you can see, you know, the, this is uh, the fact that it's in April, not in August. But uh, you can see the best place, yep, right down here. And right in, in Mexico, unfortunately. And uh, like, I, like I've said before, there, uh, Texas is probably another good place. But uh, we're going to see what happens. Okay, so let me give you some advice. Buy your solar filters right now. Check out Sky Telescope, Astronomy Magazines. Go to rainbowsymphony.com. And you can just type in solar filter, total, uh, yeah, total eclipse solar filters available. And you get a huge list of stuff. Okay, what places to go. They're cheap, they're safe. As a matter of fact, we are viewers down here that are for sale uh, when you, if you decide to uh, buy a pair of those cool glasses. Uh, they have them available, they're completely safe. Uh, for camera, binoculars, and telescopes, we have the viewer glasses I mentioned right now. Plan your observing site carefully, balancing weather, travel time, and you guessed it, safety. And make hotel reservations, and actually, uh, Bonnie and I are a little lax on that. Probably my fault, too. As soon as you can, even as you sit here watching this presentation, find it. Keep going. I'll, I'll let you make little funny noises in the background for the, or the search. But, yeah, no joking around. It's going to fill up rather quickly within the next, I would say, within the next month. And we may have a bonus. There may be, hopefully, we may see a comet, comet 12P as in periodic. Palms Brooks may be visible. You'll be able to see, you won't see Uranus, I don't think, but you'll see Jupiter and Mercury. And, of course, there's the eclipse. And there may be a comet right here waiting for you. A pair of binoculars, I'm going to try to take a shot, just a wide shot and keep my fingers crossed. So how do I take photos of this awesome event? Here's how you do what lens or telescope to use. And uh, this is just shows you basic scale. Uh, black is the full frame DSLRs, or if you're still using 35 millimeter, yes, I'm going to do it that too. Because, uh, hey, my, I'm not putting my Nikon out the pasture, I'm sorry. But I have to be Nikon versus Canon digital. The Nikon is an FE2, which is film. You still find 200 speed film in my head. This is how big it would be with a 200 millimeter or 135. So the prop trend. 400, 500, 1,000, 1,500. This starts getting a little ridiculous because at 2,000, you're cutting off all the corona. Nice balance shots between 500 and 1,000 millimeters. And technology marches on. Even a smartphone will work. How about that? Uh, this is uh, from US Cellular, but the basic information is still correct on here. And you can get a clip on telephoto. You have to understand. You look at your smartphones, they take really nice pictures and such, but that element is only about not even two millimeters to cross. So it still needs, by the way, to have a solar filter on it, but that's still tiny and it's going to get real pixelated and grainy, as we would call it in film. So the best thing you could do is to get a clip on telephoto, which gives you better image scale and actually slightly better optics. And any way you look at it, I would, instead of doing handheld like it shows here, I use a tripod. You get those mounts available. Uh, matter of fact, the next shot. Oh, yes. And for partial phases, whether you just take your camera and go click or uh, in your smartphone, or if you use a telephone, you still need, for the partial phases, you will need to have a filter, which is rated for your eyes like all these are. Kathy's got a whole bunch of them back there. I'm going to plug that so nobody goes without them. 
So you take, you buy two, one for yourself and one you cut in half and you uh, tape over this. That's a clip on telephoto. It's inexpensive. Uh, the one I picked up, uh, I picked up with shipping and everything. I think it was uh, about 14 bucks. And even without this, uh, they give you like a little eye piece. So I said, okay, let me take a look through it. Good sharp imagery. Very surprised. And this gives you great image and goes you details that are lost to the limited pixels available on a smartphone. I also recommend though getting a tripod adapter, something to hold it steady. Because believe me, you're going to be jumping around. You're going to be nervous. You're going to be seeing the shadow coming in. You're going to watch the sun disappear. It is still, knowing what's going on is great, but it's still an awesome thing to see. But again, use a tripod and don't forget the solar filter. Use a half of a solar viewer. So uh, shameless plug, get a pair from uh, Kathy for yourself and then take another one and cut it in half and give the one, one of the filters to a friend for the same kind of similar telephoto. What exposures would you do? And this is just a quick overview of it. I recommend personally keep it at ISO 200 like you're seeing here and use a tripod. Even if you are rock steady, you brace yourself against the tree, I've seen people do this, your heart is still beating. It's probably going to warp seven. And it's going to, that shape is going to get into your camera. And again, use a tripod. No, I do not sell tripods. If anybody's wondering there. Okay, and then there's a detailed guide to exposure. You pick your, your speed and your F number. Come down here, it gives you the shutter speed. I recommend not going with, oh, with the 4.0 neutral density partial. That was put in there for the sake of completeness. But quite frankly, uh, it's too dangerous to look through. And it may even damage, still damage your camera. Uh, partial at five, and you get all the exposure values just looking across the edge. Me, I just bracket, I lock it at 200 speed or 400 if I really want to push it and just go up and down the scale. And always practice safe sun. The best solar filters will cover the full aperture of your telescope and keep the heat and light of the sun out of it. Whether a glass or coated polymers, we've gotten very good at this in the last, maybe the last 15 years or so. They're all safe to view or photograph the uneclipsed or partial face of the sun. Uh, again, I'm going to do a caveat here. Look for certification. Okay. Any filter that is deemed to be safe will have the International Standards Organization, the ISO number, printed on it or its packaging. It'll read just this way. ISO 12312-2-2015 where the certification was done. That means it blocks the infrared, ultraviolet, and dims the light of the sun so that of about the full moon's brightness. If it doesn't have this on it, somewhere on it, don't use it. Everybody got that? Clear? Good. Because I'm going to be talking about what happens if you do if you don't use a good filter. These are safe filters, a glass telescope filter. Um, I've got one. I've, I've used it only for extended visual work because I fear that I'm going to be jumping around crazy, you know, trying to get the photograph, hurried with this, and then of course it's going to crash land on the on grass where a rock is very conveniently hiding. Mylar eclipse glasses. A bottom filter material, you can make your own holders if you need to. And of course, Mylar Eclipse Viewer. Black polymer glasses, which are very good. And believe it or not, a welder's glass, number 14 or higher, works fine. But it has to be welder's glass because those are certified also with ISO. Danger, Will Robinson. Do not sunglasses. You could take a dozen sunglasses and put them on. It's still... The infrared is still going to get through. Sorry, folks. Photographic neutral density filters. You can go to Kodak. You can still get them. Go to Kodak, and you can get them. Those are jello. They use carbon to make it black and lets the infrared go through, right through it like water through a sieve. Smoke glass. All right. I'll admit it. Back in the dark ages, back in the early 60s when we had an eclipse, uh, 60, 1967, we had a partial, little partial one. I tried that, too. And I'm not joking. I had a headache. For at least a day after it. So I guess I, I got lucky with the smoke glass. Polarizing filters, forget it, folks. It's going to let the old infrared right through like there's no tomorrow. And more importantly, it doesn't dim it down anywhere near enough. Compact discs, you can hold them up to a bright light. I've done it to the sun. 
looking cautiously through it, and it's still way too bright. Of course, it's leading because uh, it uses um, uh, dyes that darken and brighten with the uh, with the advent of an infrared filter, so it's not really stopping it. Floppy disk media. Anybody know what a floppy disk is? I mean, I, I still got a couple of them. You know, I, I have them in an antique uh, container. And black color film, it is black only because the chemicals, organic chemicals, have darkened the section of the film where it was exposed before you put it into your camera. It does not stop the infrared. No way, no how. <clears throat> and this, if that doesn't convince you, and this is one, they still sell this stuff. The cheapest stuff that's coming out of China and other places. This is a sunglass that you put into your your fil uh, the filter into your eyepiece, and you put it in there, and you go ooh, and look what happened after less than a minute. It shattered. You just about make it out, and you can see where it popped out the back. And there's a very foolish young person with trying to look through a smoke glass. So observers, don't let this happen to you. Now, this is from uh, an eye defect, uh, macular degeneration. But it's exactly the same thing, where the retina itself is dying or dead. And this is progressive stuff. Using improper filters can result in permanent damage to the retina of the eye. We all possess one of the finest photographic instruments known to nature. We can see over from total darkness, walking out with, into full sunlight with only a few blinks. That's a factor of between one to 16 million. We can go that far. We can see resolution. The Milky Way in, in a good sky will show you its granulation. That's unresolved stars, but they're there. You can see color, 16 million shades. Only about 250, however, in gray. But, you know, you got to have a compromise somewhere. And there is no way, right now at least, that you can repair this damage. It's permanent damage to the retina of the eye. Use only those certified I mentioned before to view the partial eclipse. I hope I got everybody scared now. Okay, good. You folks out in uh, computer land, hopefully, are also kind of like, I'm not letting that happen to me. So... Bonnie has been, had been kind a couple years ago to uh, pose for me in uh, how to use that. There is the sun. There's the target. Bonnie is facing away from the sun, as you can see by the shadow. She has solar glasses. She puts them on, makes sure that they're secured. See here. Then she does an about face and looks up to look for the sun. And she's keeping them on. She's not peeking over the edge or anything. She's looking. She can feel the heat of the sun. And she looks at it. Now, when she is done, she turns away about face and removes the glasses. And please do not, when you remove the glasses, it's like, please do not look back to see where the sun was. It's still there. <laughs> Don't worry. Okay? It ain't going to go anywhere. So. But the, sa the safest, <laughs> sorry about that. safest method of all is this. You can either use a pinhole projection. This does work. Or you can have a half a pair of binoculars and please use a cheap pair of binoculars. Okay? Because a uh, small aperture, 35 millimeter, tops 50. You block off one lens. You put a screen around it so it can't see shadow so you can see the partial phase here. Tripod mount as you can see. This is the safest method of doing it. Or the partial phases. Totality is completely safe to view. You can get creative about this. In Aruba, we saw something like this, where it was uh, one of the trees, and they act like big, big pinholes, and they cast the uh, partial phase. You can take the colander. I did that back in uh, 2017. It worked out absolutely beautifully. And my, my little baby smiles all through here. Even your fist, if you do it just right. There it is. And then, of course, uh, I'm partial toward Ritz crackers. And there it is. It's your partial face. So, you see, people complain about you eating too many crackers and tell them that it's a scientific instrument. There it are. Now, mm. uh, you said that once you reach totality, it's safe to look. That's right. I, I thought the corona 
was a lot of UV. Uh, no, Corona, no, no. It, uh, the UV, that part of the UV spectrum, stopped cold by the uh, by the Earth's atmosphere. Mm -hmm. It's the wrong wavelength. The infrared is what we're really worried about here. Mm -hmm. okay. So, so you can get creative. You can do almost anything you want to do with the totality. Some people don't even photograph it. They just sit back. They uh, set up a chair. They have uh, an umbrella that does not get in their way when they want you. Uh, and they basically play, you know, fly casual. If they want to see the partial phases, they'll, they'll bum a ride off other people's instruments and such. But totality itself, like I said, you know that shadow is coming out of there. It's going to go over you whether you're ready or not. And when it does go over you, it is awe striking. It is an amazing thing to see. So, Joel, who will get to the center line. We'll hope on here. I'm hoping to do that. Best of weather, good camaraderie, the fellow observers, good equipment, operations, and don't fight being astonished. In every eclipse I've seen of totality, and all six of them so far, I I gotta admit, I take a moment or two to look away from the camera. I don't look up into the finder. I look at it as humans have done it ever since we started noticing that the sun does fade out occasionally here and there. And it is an incredible, awe-striking thing. You've got to see it to believe it. And by the way, also, don't be discouraged trying to figure out what exposure you have to do. Yeah, or what kind of film. Or how do I set my DSLR up or all this stuff. Or program it so it does a little work for me, which is cheating. Uh, all this. This is the very first photograph of totality. It was taken in 1851 by Johann Berkel Berkowski. It took 84 seconds, 84 seconds to get this tin, tintype image. It's the oldest photograph we have of it. And even it showed on the edges, prominences, and the beginning of the corona and such. So if your pictures don't quite, when you take your pictures, they're not quite that well exposed. You did far better in that thousandth of a second than he did in 84. <laughs> and by the way, the eclipse was not even 90 seconds long. So he had to sit there and he had to guide it. So here's uh, some sources of filters and viewers. Rainbow Symphony, we have their uh, their viewer glasses back here. Daystar, Orion Telescopes, and Thousand Oaks. And there are others out there as well. And uh, this is cool. In rating na nature's wonders, on a scale of 1 to 10, a total eclipse of the sun is a million. That's Fred Espinak. He's an experienced eclipse chaser who has seen over 30 totalities. Lucky dog. But we just lost this guy, unfortunately, last year. Look at this. 74 eclipses during a career spanning, what, about 60 years? Of all kinds. And if, you've, if anybody's got a copy of Peterson's Field Guide to the Stars and Planets, he was the most recent editor of it, and he revamped that book like none before. Did an incredible job. We owe him a great deal in doing that. So we'll inspire our new generations. Uh, the kicker of this is he was 18 and he was accepted into Harvard College back in 1959. Uh, Donald Menzel, who was a solar observer primarily, uh, invited him on a DC-3 to go out chasing after an eclipse in 1959, going off the coast of Massachusetts. And he got hooked. Who boy did he get hooked? Like I said, look at that, 74 eclipses of the sun. And I really, we miss him. He's relatively young, too. He passed away. Okay, so suggested reading, totality, Mark Lippman and Fred Espinak. I discovered that book in 1991 in a bookstore in Kona, Hawaii. And I just, I read through it, blew through the book. Lots of advice, lots of information, lots of history. Uh, your guide to the 2024 solar eclipse, Michael Backick. He's an editor. I think he's a chief editor of Astronomy Magazine. A terrific writer. Road Atlas for the total solar eclipse of 2024. Uh, get the color version. It's better. Trust me. Better contrast by Fred Espinak, the gentleman I mentioned before. Eclipse Bulletin, total solar eclipse of 2024, April 8th by Espinak and Jay Anderson. And total solar eclipse 2025, Mark Newsbaum. That's a relatively recent publication. I recommend all these. And I also have to thank my wife, Bonnie, who kept this thing one way, shape, or form 
coherent, and also a fellow Eclipse Chaser, Mary, who allows me to do these talks here, and I really appreciate that. NASA and European Space Agency, Wayne Augenstein and Mike Luchik, both Eclipse Chasers, and all our members that have traveled this planet uh, to bathe in the light of the corona. You know, but this is so amazing to be able to see this and know what it is. Cavemen and women probably hid from the light. We know what it is, and we will go there. I wish everyone luck. And that's it. Before we do that, um, I'm going to put this up here. I made copies of that slide where it has Eclipse uh, 2024 suggested reading. I'm going to put them out here. And it's hard to make a bums rush to the people in the program first. There it is. And also, uh, sort of a guide that I put together. Uh, uh, some of the slides over here I printed out. Lens focal length. With image size, uh, exposure guide, more exposure guide, and then uh, the, forget about the annual aura over here. It shows annual aura and uh, the total eclipse and the timings and such. And for those that are going to insist on using a uh, smartphone, is smartphone information as well. Uh, and yeah, those who want to see the uh, half of totality, we're going to be about 90 percent of uh, partial. You still going to need a filter, but it goes shows you the pathway and what to expect. And unfortunately, too, I had to throw this in, so you have to balance again the clouds and everything. But uh, we are it's April, so we're not exactly the best uh, place in the world up here. Maybe we get lucky. So, like I said, down here in the blue area, that's the best place to go. However, you know, your decision, your results may vary. And then all the major cities within the path of totality down here. And I got a limited number. We run out of them. Don't panic. Just let me know you want another copy. I'll make more for next, uh, next week. So here they are. Now we'll take questions. Go. Is there something innate in film that's missing in digital when you're taking these photos? I've heard debates up and down, right and left about that. The way I look at it, you get a picture, you're going to probably digitalize it anyway. <laughs> so, you know, it's easier. You, you miss a step. You don't have to worry about it. But I recommend it. You know, give it a try. This is all experimental. I like film only because it has a certain color depth. So uh, digital has almost a cold feel about it. But they've gotten around that, too, with software. So, uh, so it's editing. It's, it's basically, uh, you know, name your poison. <laughs> Uh, I like film only because it does have that warm depth, and I'm also a traditionalist. Uh, digital is relatively new to me, but most of us do. Uh, in fact, I just picked up, a, I have uh, two digital cameras, a uh, Canon uh, 3T and a Canon 7T. Uh, I like the 3T because it's less complicated. And if you're under a sky, you're under duress, you're trying to get your picture, and you don't know what the hell the camera's doing. No thank you. And they're done that, so. I'll take pictures of people with the uh, the 7T, and the other one is a, the the 3T is a workhorse. So, okay, uh, let's anybody else over here too before everyone's totally stunned. That first photo of Corona gets everybody. Yeah, one more. Could you speak to how to align the cameras before the eclipse? I mean, you're looking at the sun, I imagine. Yes. So through the filter? Through yeah, the you have to put it through the filter. Otherwise, you don't dare look at it. Without it. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So then when you get close to, you know, usually somebody's going to count it off for you. Have your own, you set your smartphone or your smartwatch or an ordinary dumb watch like this. And so that, <laughs> that 10 seconds to totality, and you can make sure the time is right, too. At T minus 10 seconds, you're listening at about five. You get away from the camera, you've scented it, take the filter carefully off and start taking shots. That, I would start at a thousandth of a second, no matter what speed you're going on. Is that okay? That will limit the amount of exposure to the film or to the digital element. And then as it goes in totality, you'll see the diamond ring effect. 
and maybe even a couple of Bailey's beads because that's the, the light of the sun shining through craters around the edge of the moon. And then they fade out, and so do the corona jumps out. And that's when, that's when all, of, all bets are off. Start at a thousandth and work your way up. Uh, I've seen people do 10 second exposures uh, on that, and you get the extreme corona uh, while everything else is burned in and everything in between. Uh, I have yet to see anyone not come away from a to total eclipse without at least one photograph. So, with our digital cameras, you're probably doing that four minutes average, <coughs> you know, almost 500 pictures of all kinds. So as long as you got a good stable map, that's the whole thing, too. And there's no accumulated effect in the camera? Uh, there's, well, if you're really worried about mirror slap, uh, you can get mirrorless cameras nowadays, which, I mean, it's just point and shoot. No vibration, no nothing. But then again, there's going to be enough vibration for everybody around you. So, you never know. So, I saw a hand in the back, yeah. The thing about the Ritz cracker and the uh, colander, yeah. Yeah. I'd like you to elaborate on that because isn't that still seeing it with the naked eye? And it's in there? No, because you're not looking looking directly at the sun. This is just sunlight. Yes, it's unfiltered, but it's not concentrated on the eye. You're not looking up that, at that source and letting your eye do. You're looking at it reflected off the piece of paper. Oh, what have you? So yeah, you're not gonna hold no, you're not gonna hold the Ritz cracker up and look at it. You'll probably eat it first. Uh, I would. Uh, but you hold it up and you'll be able to do it. And actually, that was a good working picture. I'm amazed that the guys able to get the photo. But yeah, anywhere else, everyone's totally stunned. Either that, or they want me to shut up so I can come up oh, here. Well, ask the people online. Now. Ask what? if anybody online. Wants oh to yeah. That's a good good thing. Is there anybody online that has a question? Yeah, Barbara Drew. Uh, can't you use a welder's goggle? A weld, yeah, with a 14, number 14 welders. Number 14, yeah. That's what I thought. Yeah, if you like looking at a green sun, there was a, <laughs> there was a Superman comic that had that. Don't ask. Uh, but seriously, though, uh, it'll be a green color because of the, the density of the filter and the chemicals that are used to make it dark. But yeah, she can use that. Uh, if, I mean, we got. Uh, uh, viewing glasses here. If you got a telescope uh, that uh, you would like to have a filter for it, let me know what size it is. If it's relatively small, and I got a couple extra filters. So I went filter crazy uh, about well, six months ago just to make sure I would get something. So, okay. Anyone else online? Everyone's Good job, Al. Ah, thank you. We try. Okay, go. Yeah. I turn thank, this over to thank, Mary. Thanks, Al. Um, we're just about done. I just want to mention that next week is next week, January 19th, is our monthly meeting. Um, we will be up at the Roy Smith Theater on the main campus here at Cranford. Um, and so Sperry Observatory will not be open until after 10 p.m. that night. But we will have a guest speaker. Um, everybody is welcome to come. We will have a guest speaker, Dr. Matt Garrison, I believe that's it, from Goddard Space Flight Center. And uh, the title of his presentation is The Long Tour and the Big Plunge. It's about the Lucy and Da Vinci missions at NASA Goddard. Okay, so hopefully you can join us then. And then, as I said, after 10 o'clock, we open the observatory. We come back here for refreshments and hopefully observing if it's clear. And I want to thank everybody for coming. And thank Al. This is great. Really good information. We sell the solar glasses in the back. Um, and that's it. Thanks, everybody. See you. Take it easy, man. Okay.